lots of ground to cover today. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. I think you find it handy to have a pen um, out because we probably want to jot some notes down on some of the handouts as we go through them today. But before we get to the specifics of the persuasive speech, let me just sort of forecast and give you a global view of what the, the rest of the semester looks like because, as you know, there's not much of it left. So, we're um, going to be heading for a special visit on Friday, and it's going to be, you might want to jot this down, 2.30C in the library, because we're going to be doing some research on your persuasive speech. I know you went in for a general, you know, sort of a research review, probably before your informative speech, is that correct? Um, but Matt Cohn has some phenomenal resources that are specifically geared toward persuasive speakers, and my goal, or my hope for each of you, is that when we finish that session on Friday, you should be able to walk out the door with all, if not most, of your research materials for this paper, which will be a great time saver for you. Um, so that's what Friday is going to be, so don't come here first, just meet us right there at 230C in the library. Then, um, we'll go over the, all the specifics that have to deal with persuasive speech, all the requirements and the assignments and things like that uh, in just a minute. But then, um, let's also forecast um, how that's going to look. So, we will start, you know, with our research on Friday. Next week will be our work week in terms of getting ready for that persuasive speech. We also have a few of the ceremonial speeches that we need to finish up on Monday as well. So it'll be a busy week next week. Then we'll spend the remaining, the, actually the last two weeks of the semester actually presenting the persuasive speeches. And then your final exam is going to be not so much a final as it's going to be a test on chapters 16 and 17 from your text both of which have to deal with persuasive speaking. So for that particular test, what we're looking at is uh, slightly over 50 questions. Um, the questions are almost all multiple choice, although sometimes multiple choice can be darn tricky, you know. Um, and then there's also a few short answer, we'll call them essay questions, but it's really a matter of probably two or three sentences per answer for those short answer ones. That test is going to be administered online, so you can take it at Starbucks, you can take it in the library, you can take it pretty much wherever you would like. My hope is, is that, especially with this class being smaller numbers than some of the others, is that we will finish our presentations by that last Wednesday of the <coughs> class meeting week, and that on May 10th, you will be wherever taking the online test which means that you would not need to report, at least for this class, during exam week. I know that um, Ms. Ballard said that there was an experience that, that you had earlier in the semester with taking an online test, uh, but if any of you feel uncomfortable with that at all, just let me know and I'll be glad to sit through a demo with you so that you don't have to worry a bit. Now since it's an online test, I want you, I strongly encourage, please don't do it without your text in hand. It's really a learning activity even more than a test because I really want you to be able to understand the concepts that we covered in persuasion. Because like it or not, no matter what job you're pursuing in the future, persuasion will be part of your life. So that's how the, the sort of big picture looks. Any questions that you have on that right now? What, Jessica? What, two chapters? Um, at 16 and 17. Mm -hmm. Yep, Zaya. And is that just going to be open all the time or can be taken before or that? Probably not earlier that week, as I have a number of classes that will be taking the test. And um, generally, I try to allow a 24-hour period for the test to be open, though, so that if you are one of those early risers and you like to take the test at 6 a.m., go for it. Uh, likewise, it will be open until about 11.30 p.m. Um, is, is it, like, so can you start at, like, 7? And, then um, or does it have to be taken out? Thanks, that's a very good point. Um, the tests have a way of timing themselves out. So if you start the test and you get halfway through, and then you go, oh shoot, I have to take the dog for a walk. <laughs> and you come back and the test will say, oh, so sad, too bad. So yeah, you do have to do it in one setting. So you just have to kind of look at your calendar and go, hmm. And I'm thinking with 50 questions, if you allow, this is generous, if you allow yourself two hours, you should be fine. Um, is this something where we could take it with others? 
No, thank you so much for clarifying that too. This is, right. again, the expectation is, is that this is your test. All right. As an individual. Does that make anybody terribly nervous? If it does, please see me because I'm happy to help you out with you know, the techniques on how to take an online test and so on. All right, so um, one of the things I did earlier today that some of you already mentioned is that I put together a list of what's due when. And so this, I think, will help to allay some of the fears that people have because once we get done with the hour today, it's going to feel like there are a number of things that you're responsible for, and guess what? You are. <laughs> so I put it all together in a simple, easy to follow list for you. So let's, um, we'll start talking about the persuasive speech. But before we even do that, I'd like to ask kind of what might seem like an on face question. How many of you have brothers or sisters? And you don't have to raise your hand on this one, but you can pick it in your head. How many of you had parents who at one point or time said, why can't you be more like your sister, your brother, or whatever, and your brother never does anything like that, and your sister doesn't do it that way? What, what's the matter with you? I mean, I have three younger sisters, so I know I heard that more than once. Well, same thing's true with teachers. You know, I mean, if you haven't picked up on it already, I'm sure you will very soon. Ms. Ballard and I have a very different approach in the classroom. And um, it's not that one's right and one's wrong, it's just plain old different. Just as when you get out to start working in the world, you'll have one boss one year that you'll think, oh my goodness, it makes coming to work a breeze. And then the next year you might get transferred and you'll have a new boss and you go, why did I ever go into this line of work? So there are just differences in people. If you have any trouble with the differences that you're experiencing with me, be sure to email me, come talk to me after class. I am a very approachable person. So don't, don't ever for a minute feel uncomfortable, distressed, or worried about a thing. Because if there's one thing I am, it's pro-student, and I want you all to be successful on this. In fact, the way I put this assignment together, it's going to be pretty easy to capture a really good grade on this if you want to do the work. Does anybody have any questions right now? Let's find out what persuasive speech looks like. So, um, most of you, or some of you, have had the opportunity to enter your topic for your persuasive speech online in the discussion board for a Blackboard site. If you're still thinking, oh, I just don't know what to do, well, here's some more outlets for you. And this PowerPoint is posted in the, in the persuasive speech folder, so you can always open up the PowerPoint and click on these live links. You have to run the show for the links to be live, though. So by tonight, each one of you should have declared this is what I'm going to use for a topic for my persuasive speech. And do remember, too, that as you go on in to enter your persuasive topic, you need to look through anybody else who's already entered them, because we don't want to have two speeches on the same topic. Now, one of the foundational pieces that you'll be working with a lot, and that's discussed in chapters 16 and 17, is the use of a certain type of device to convince people to your point of view. This is called the three pillars of public speaking, ethos, pathos, and logos. They're like the three musketeers. Because if you're missing one of those musketeers, your persuasive speech isn't as strong as it could be. So let's take a look at this brief video as to what these three pillars of public speaking entail and how you can use them to convince us. Great speakers throughout time have been able to change their listeners' minds and even move their, move their audiences into action through the art of persuasion. Consider these persuasive speakers and how they changed the world through what they said. For example, JFK, in his speech where he said, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. Or Ronald Reagan 20 years ago when he said, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. Or Obama, who inspired a nation to believe in hope instead of fear. Nelson Mandela, Gandhi, and even Oprah, who persuades people every day to know better and to do better. Or how about these leaders? Jim Jones brainwashed his congregation, knew 900 of them unknowingly to their death through a mass suicide order. Now, obviously, not all of these speakers are viewed as positive forces of change. These last examples even changed the world for the worst. But let's face it, they 
did it through the art of persuasion. Now, considering the fact that persuasion can be used for many purposes, it is important that individuals exercise ethical, persuasive methods when seeking to persuade an audience. Let's face it, you can get an audience to believe anything you want them to if you have the right facts, a persuasive approach, and sometimes a willing audience. Some people accuse Obama of this. Others accuse Rush, Rush Limbaugh of the same thing. But the fact remains that both of these men have been persuasive to certain people groups by using information and motivational appeals. However, presenting facts on only one side of an issue without being transparent about the other side of the issue is sometimes unfair and unethical in seeking to persuade an audience. Think about it, I'm sure you've been on the receiving end of gossip. Perhaps someone twisted a truth about you into something that wasn't true because they didn't share the whole truth or the full story. When people use information to make it say what they want it to say without sharing the other side, this can sometimes be considered unethical persuasion. It is important to use information and motivational appeals ethically. So let's talk about some specific motivational appeals summarized by the Greek philosopher Aristotle thousands of years ago. He believed that to be truly effective speaker or writer, you had to appeal to three things when giving information to an audience or reader. The first is ethos or credibility. Ethos refers to the way in which a person convinces someone else to believe him or her simply by his or her character, credibility, and trustworthiness. We tend to believe and follow people we can respect. One can often increase ethos by being knowledgeable about your topic so that you have the authority and right to speak on the subject matter you are presenting. Another way to increase ethos is to appear thoughtful, fair, and respectful of alternative points of view. Your accuracy and thoughtfulness in crediting your sources, professionalism in caring about your speech and its structure, your proper use of grammar, and your overall personal neatness are all part of the appeal to ethos. The second motivational appeal described by Aristotle is pathos. Pathos refers to persuading by appealing to an audience's emotions, values, and beliefs. Word choice affects the audience's emotional response, and emotional appeals can effectively be used to enhance persuasion. This means that your speech should not only be someone else's words or research, you must tie together your research by crafting your speech with your own words in a way that is persuasive and interesting for your audience. The third emotional appeal is logos. As you may assume from the term, logos is an appeal to reason or logic. This will be the most important technique you will use in your persuasive speech, and was Aristotle's favorite. It includes the internal consistency and clarity of your speech. It requires that you make a claim and use quality reasons and evidence to support your claim. Just like a lawyer crafts his or her argument with a logical flow that appeals to the minds of the jury, so too must you put together a speech that has a logical flow of persuasion. Giving reason is the heart of persuasion and cannot be emphasized enough. You simply cannot and should not seek to persuade without strong information and a strong logical flow of that information. Using ethos or credibility, pathos or emotional appeals, and logos or logic is important for any persuasive speaker. If you're seeking to truly persuade an audience, it's important to have all three like one leg missing from a three-legged stool would cause the stool to collapse, so will your argument or persuasion collapse if you're missing one of these important motivational appeals. Remember, persuasion is not just standing in front of an audience and rattling off facts in hopes that your information will get an audience to change. The speaker must play an active role in persuasion. You are part of your persuasive message, and your credibility, emotional appeals, and logic are important when preparing your speech. So good luck as you prepare to persuade. Changing minds, hearts, and actions isn't easy, but with the right attitude and preparation, you can succeed. Prepare for your own success, and have fun while doing it. So, I jotted just some quick notes down here just to help you keep those three different pillars uh, separated in your own mind. Whenever you say, after doing a lot of research on this topic, after investigating seven different websites, whenever you say things like that, 
What you want your audience to do is to go, whoa, this person did their work. They know what they're talking about. That's ethos. That's your credibility with <coughs> us as an audience. Um, pathos, if you think of pathos as the heart, you know, if you can bring a tear to someone's eye, if you can cause them some internal anguish, then you're doing pathos. So you're appealing to our emotions, getting us to feel, you know, concerned about your particular topic. And logo. <laughs> Sorry about that, I forgot the yes. S. <laughs> Logos, on the other hand, um, if you think of yourself as a lawyer, up here, putting together a case, and encouraging us to follow a certain action, that's a lot of the logos aspect of this particular speech. You're analytical. You are putting together excellent sources of information and you're citing your research so that we know you have a credible argument that you put together. And it's just not enough in this speech <coughs> to say, you know, there was a study I read some time ago that said, no, that's not going to impress us much. You need to be able to cite your sources and build your, you know, your contact with us on that. Um, for those of you who remember, does anybody remember Star Trek? I hope you do. Spock. If you remember Spock, Spock was a character who had the pointed ears, and no matter what was being said, Spock would go, hmm, that's not logical. And he wouldn't accept any arguments that had anything to do with emotions, but rather he always wanted the logical appeal. You need to pick up a card? If there's one over there. This one's running. Okay. You can go ahead and pull it out, though. That's fine. Oh, no. Just shove my case I, out I of the way. I just need to grab one of them. Oh, well, this one's running right now. It's recording. Yeah. Okay. So those are the three ethical pillars that you'll be using in your speech preparation. Now, what you, you're not going to be just sort of creatively deciding how you're going to persuade us. But rather, you're going to use a very specific way of putting this speech together. And let me tell you that in many aspects, this makes your job so much easier. You don't have to think it all up on your own. Because if you follow the sequence that I'm going to share with you, number one, you'll meet the requirements of the assignment. And second of all, you'll have a very credible, persuasive speech. Now, this might seem a bit dated. My goodness, it came about in the 1930s. But if you've seen that commercial on television for the Sham Wow, you've seen Monroe's Motivated Sequence in Action. It is the most honorable, time-tested way that advertisers or speakers have found to try to change their audience to their point of view. And so that's why we're going to give you some experience with this. So, Monroe's Motivated Sequence has some very specific steps. And if you have that green handout in front of you right now, that's the one that we're going to be talking about. So you might want to just jot some notes down there as you go along. Um, I'm not sure, you know, I, I'm not sure what kind of instruction or requirements you've had for in, introductions for in this class. But if you take a look, this one, Jessica. If you take a look at the gray handout right here, there are a number of different things that you, as a speaker, can do to capture our attention. It might be that you use some startling statistic as the first words out of your mouth. Or it might be that you come up with a story that tugs at our heartstrings to get us introduced to the topic. Whatever you want to do, there's a number of different things that you can do. And they're all mentioned right here on this handy bookmark. But you'll notice up here that I have one caveat. I'm saying, don't you use a rhetorical question. Anybody have a guess why I would say no rhetorical questions? Yeah, it's easy in one in, in, in one respect. But what else does it do? It makes people think about the rhetoric behind the question instead of your opening. Right. If I say driving drunk in Wisconsin is a really terrible topic, um, what do you think about it? What do you do? Well, you do what I told you to do. You start thinking about it in your own head, and you're making up your own conclusions and, and whatever they might be. But it might not be where I want you to go as a, as a persuasive speaker. So don't use rhetorical questions because you don't want your audience to answer and have your own point of view. You want to be able to influence that point of view. So you can use one or more off of these. By all means, don't use them all. Because one thing that I'll repeat time and again in the preparation of this speech is to be short and concise. Because you will be amazed at how much time you consume just hitting all of these points. Okay. Yeah. 
Could you like not use rhetorical questions with any of these speeches, or is that just for this one? Oh no, that's just for persuasion. Thank you for that clarification. Rhetorical questions, you know, when you did your informative speeches, I bet you heard a lot of them, and that's good because that gets your top, your your audience warmed up to your topic. But in the persuasive speech, we don't want people to start thinking about what their beliefs are. We want them to be kind of malleable so that we can change their mind as we go along. Thanks for that clarification. So after you open with a good story or some startling statistics, um, what else do, happens in the introduction? Two more steps. So A, B, and C represent the steps that you need to cover. The next thing you need to do is to connect with your audience. Your audience is not going to be very persuasible if you haven't connected with them at some level. Now I'm going to talk in a little bit about an audience analysis that you're going to do, which will give you great fodder for this one right here. So you might want to, on that little green sheet of paper, you might want to jot down audience analysis next to that because that will help you to fulfill step two, step B on this outline right here. And then the third step in every introduction should be ethos. And we already talked a little bit about what ethos is all about, but you need to establish yourself as an expert in some way, shape, or form on this particular topic. So what are your credentials? For some of you, it'll be, you know, I've been, I've been living with this all my life. For some of you, it will be, I've read seven articles that have to do with the topic today. Um, so, you know, what is it about you that makes you qualified to stand up here and take up our time? <coughs> Questions that you have on the introduction. Three easy steps. Okay. Step two, Roman numeral two right here. This is where you introduce the problem to us. But the solution does not pass your lips. You have to, if you'll excuse my broken English, awfulize the topic for us so that we care about it. You have to show us how terrible this problem is. And how do you do that? In four easy steps. Step one, state the problem in as simple uh, uh, terms as you can. One sentence, clear, clean, crisp, Concise. Think of yourself again in the role of a lawyer. Then go on to illustrate the problem. Give us some examples. Tell us some stories. Share some statistics. Here's where you want to use the other bookmark. All of the verbal supports that are here are different ways that you can use in, in the B part of this, of this particular step. So, you can do an analysis, you can do brief examples, you can do yada, yada, yada. They're all listed here for you to think about and ponder. You have to realize that when you do your research on Friday, that's what's going to give you the ammo for those. Then, in step C, you have to show the ramifications of this problem. Does it cost something? Does it pretend to present a health risk for us? What is it that is, is the reason? you know, the, the implications of this particular problem on us. So that's the ramification step. And again, that's probably two, three sentences. It's not two pages because you don't have time. Clean, crisp, concise. Then the last thing is that you point out how this affects the audience. So I've told you about the problem of drunk driving in Wisconsin. Who's next? Who will walk into class one day having lost one of their loved ones? Whoa. Big honking use of pathos as I point out the direct effect of this problem on you. So, questions on the problem step. Do you know the solution yet? Nope. Then what comes next is probably something you've used in your other speeches. They're called transitions. And I always love the image of a bridge because with the bridge. You start out at one place and you end up someplace else. With this transition from bridge in your persuasive speech, you start out at the, at the problem. So I've described to you the issue that drunk driving has become in the state of Wisconsin. And you take us across the bridge to the solution. Now let me tell you how we can remedy this problem. So it's just one step. It should connect, so you should mention the problem and then mention that you're, that you're going to the solution. That's the purpose of that transition. It's one sentence. Now, we get into the big stuff, the big guns. 
we go to the solution step of your problem. Five steps that you need to do. This gets a bit complicated, but it also, if you catch on to these, this is what you're looking for when you do your research on Friday. Step one, state the solution, please, in one clear, easy to understand sentence. What is it that will solve this problem? Not a paragraph, a sentence. Then, in part B, go on to explain who will have to do what to make this conclusion work, what will have to happen, when will it happen, how will it happen, and then flesh out the solution in step B. In step C, and throughout your speech, don't ever fall into the trap of saying, oh, I read a study once where, but always use citations, because that increases your ethos, and it also creates a believable argument. So in step C, you show how the problem is going to solve it, uh, solve this, how this solution is going to solve the problem. Step D is kind of interesting. You might remember from the video where they said that it's unethical to present just one side of the issue. Well, let's make sure that the audience doesn't think that this is just your way of solving the problem, but discuss other people who have used the solution. And depending on the topic of your speech, this can take on lots of different forms. It might be what other states have employed. Um, it might be what other people you've known have done. I, I can't answer the question specifically as to what that will be, but find some information that shows how others have used this solution to create an answer to the problem. And then, as again, in reference to the video, who's going to be against your, your um, solution to the problem? Acknowledge at least two objections that people might have to adopting your solution, and then refute them. Doesn't have to be a long one again. You know, some people may say that if, uh, if people are not allowed to drive drunk in Wisconsin, that will decrease our tourism. Well, to that I would reply, and want to say a couple of sentences about that, so you get the gist of how that works. Is it making sense? Sounds like an old Perry Mason show? Yeah, a little bit. My favorite part, part four, is visualization. You have been like a lawyer up on stage, kind of hammering home the points and citing your citations and building this case and giving your solution. But now you step back, and I like to think of, of step four as being the poet in you. If you don't follow my solution, here's what the state is going to look like. There will be more people missing at the Christmas gatherings. There will be more people dying far too young and not living up to their full potential unless we do something about drunk driving. And then, after you make us all, you know, really feel the pain of not following your solution and what the world's going to look like without it, then you go, ah, but the world can be a brighter place. If you follow my solution, this will happen, this will happen, this will happen, and the world's going to be a better place. So you take us down to depths of a home, and then you bring us up to the heights with the second step in the visualization process. It's a great place for the storyteller and all of you. Guess what? We're at the end. The action step. The action step is the last thing out of your mouth, and it has three easy-to-follow steps. One, you're very familiar with. Summarize your main points. Um, and then in step two, B, Restate, again, why this is so important to the audience. You've got to get them. It's, it's the audience is what it's all about. And then finally, this tricky little C, call to action. And I know I've given some examples in class already about effective call to actions, but it really has to be, for this speech, I want you to explore what you can do that will have a concrete action. It's not enough to say, I want you to think about drunk driving and make sure you never do it. That's soft. That's windy. You know, what is it that you can do in a concrete action step that, that, might, that, that you could have the audience do? Sign a petition. Give them a, a listing of a website where they can look up information. Something concrete that the audience can do. I know, for instance, today until 5 in room 142, they have a drunk driving simulator. Uh, encouraging your audience to attend an event like that might be. Exactly. But not just encourage them. Well, Hand them a card that says, here's where the drunk driving simulator is going to be next. It's going to be here on this date at this time. Sign up. 
So something physical that Be you there or you'll die. <laughs> there we go. And there's a little bit of pathos going there. So in a nutshell, those are the steps in the Monroe's motivated sequence. Now, let's pause here for just a second. And give me questions about anything that seemed unclear or head scratching on that. It's a lot. Well, not necessarily about what you just went over, but like I saw with the email, it said on Friday something. Is this the audience now? <laughs> Thank you, Zaire. That's where we're going next. Okay. <laughs> Actually, I'm going to do one step in between, Zaire. Um, I've got this list up here for you that Zaire is referring to, and we will be looking at that in just a moment. But right now, um, the sheet that I'd like you to take out, let's look at the assignment um, descriptor itself. So that's the white sheet because I have to have you do some editing. I've been asked to try to keep your class um, in alignment with um, what Ms. Ballard wants as the grading scheme, which means 1,100 points accumulated at the maximum by the end of the semester. So I've had to change and tweak a few things several times in order to make it fit, but I think we've got it to fit right now. So let's talk about the assignment itself. Okay. So you're going to read chapter 16 and 17, and even though chapter 16 and 17 give you, I don't know, half a dozen different ways of persuading people, ignore them all because you're only going to use Monroe's motivated sequence. That's a requirement for this project. Um, your topic we've already talked about. Um, make sure that uh, the topic has a concrete action and is relevant to the audience. Time. I know this might seem like a lot, but it won't by the time you get done writing. The speech has to be six minutes long, but no more than eight. And for me, the acceptable range then becomes five and a half to eight and a half. So that's a pretty big target. If you're flying overhead with a parachute strapped to your back, you ought to be able to land within that amount of time. But the only way that you're going to be able to do that is if you rehearse. You really have to rehearse this speech until you get three perfect practices in front of your bathroom mirror. That's what it takes. You can't, unlike a paper that you can, some of us who are talented can pull off in one night, you can't pull off a speech, not very well, in one night. You are going to be required. And if anyone doesn't believe that, they are free to watch the video of my last speech <laughs> on Blackboard. Um, you're too hard on yourself. Visual support. You have to use something. It can be a PowerPoint. Here's some, I've had some pet peeves, I'll admit it. Oh, I can be cranky. Um, I get cranky when I see people uh, pull up a PowerPoint, but they don't run the PowerPoint, they just click on an image here, and then it's like, oh, I think this is the one I want to show you. Oh, oh no, that's not it. I want this one. Oh, no, that's not it. Oh, drives me nuts. So if you're going to use PowerPoint, use PowerPoint. Run the program. This is this is really hard for me because we, we aren't allowed to install plugins or anything on the school computers, and whereas it would be very easy and possible to have something on your phone to change slides or hit something on your... You can't do it because you can't run the client-side PowerPoint plugin to control PowerPoint with your phone. Uh, is a laptop an option? If I had a long enough cord, then I could hit a button on my laptop while I was well, in front of the podium. Well, all I'm thinking is, who was it this It's was still... It it did? You hooked your computer up here, right? That's not a bad yeah. plan. That's what I did. I think she just means be organized enough to have it... Yes, yeah. yes, exactly. No, I'm just saying that's been a problem for me because it, it sucks to go back to the keyboard oh, and to change that. Oh, and believe me, you are identifying an issue in the work world too. You know, somebody walks into a corporate meeting and you've got your PowerPoint all ready to go, and oops, they don't have the same version. So, yeah, by all means, let's test out anything that you want to show so that it does work here. But it doesn't have to be a PowerPoint. You know, you can have a very effective printout of a graph or a diagram or something you want us to look at and put it on the doc cam. It shows up really well. Yeah, but it's good to get experience making these since that's what we would be using in the real work world. Yes, yeah, it's, it's, it is. It hasn't gone away. People trash PowerPoint, but, you know, it has a lot of advantages too. Um, verbal supports. Here's one thing that's going to be kind of a kicker in your outline, is that you have to identify logos, pathos, and ethos where you use them. Now, I'm not saying that every single step in that numerous steps that we went through in the outline has to have a label after it, but the majority of them should be labeled because you purposely decided to tug at our heartstrings, using pathos, or you decided to appeal to our logic, 
And therefore, you have to label those so that, we, so that I know that you know that you're purposefully using those elements of persuasion. Now, the outline for your speech is going to be turned in twice. Ah, she said twice. Yeah, she said twice. Um, here's the deal. By class time, next week, Wednesday, I want you to have submitted online a draft of what your persuasive speech is going to look like. And I'll show you the outline format in just a minute. And then the final copy of your persuasive message is going to be posted on, on Blackboard on Friday. So let's kind of move quickly. So during the next week, I realize that. Now, the kicker is not only do you have to submit it on on by next Wednesday, but you have to bring five copies of your preparation outline. We know it's a draft, it doesn't have to be perfect, but bring your, your draft in because we're going to use it for a really valuable class exercise that will help you to improve your speech. So those are two assignments. You have to have three, I call them reputable, sources. Wikipedia, not a source. However, if you scroll down to the bottom of almost any Wikipedia article, there are, some, there are some sources that the person used that might be very good indeed. So don't discount it, it's just that you can't cite Wikipedia as, as one of your sources. And again, like I say, on Friday, my hope is, is that every one of you will walk out of class with at least two-thirds, if not all, of your research materials in hand. When we get done with this and you get to view your speech, which you have to do, I'll be recording these, then I want you to sit down and have a good heart-to-heart -heart talk with yourself. How did you do? I'm not grading you on you know, whether you think you were wonderful. That's not it. I really want you to be, give yourself an honest appraisal of what worked, what didn't. If you're human, and last time I checked, most of you are, it, it's probably not going to be a perfect speech. Nothing that we ever do is perfect, we're human. So you know, take some time to reflect on that. Now, here's where I need you to have pen in hand to correct the copy that you have. Because like I said, I have to get this to fit within the framework of, uh, of 1,100 points. And so the draft outline submitted and brought to class is worth 15 points. When you bring your draft outline to class next Wednesday and you help in a work group that I'll set up, you help that those other people to edit your outline so that it achieves you know, a high level of perfection, you get an additional 10 points for that. You can't do that outside of class. You have to be here to win. 15 points is for your audience analysis, and I promise I am going to get to that next. 75 points for your final preparation outline. 150 points for the actual presentation of your speech. And then I use a different style of peer reviews than what you've used. And I, th I think that you may actually, dare I say, enjoy it. Um, I put together a packet for you, and it has three or four specific questions that you have to answer. And you'll be kind of on the fly, quickly critiquing each person who speaks here. That means you got to be here for the speeches in order to accumulate those points. And then, last but not least, your self-evaluation is also worth 15 points. So that's a lot of points you know, toward the end of the semester here now. Questions that you have so far? Yes, I am. Um, the draft outline and the peer edit are both on Wednesday the 24th? The draft outline and, and what, the peer edit isn't something you're going to turn in, it's an activity that no, we'll do right. in class. I'm just wondering if that's also. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so we have to have your draft in order for you to be able to peer edit. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Oh, wow. Take a look at that pink sheet that you have out in front of you. Look at the grand copy of that here that's put on the back end. Right now, you might have a general notion about how, pe about how people feel about your topic. You might be able to predict somewhat how they're going to react to your speech. But what we want to do is we want to document that. And so I am asking you to prepare an audience analysis. And this can be as short as six questions and up to eight. I would stay away from the 10 that I had mentioned there. I think six to eight questions is plenty. And here's what you're going to do. You're going to type up an audience analysis, and because you're a nice, polite, professional person, you're going to use an opening, something like this. 
you can be more creative than what's here, or if you want to, you can just copy this, that's fine. But you need to have an opening at the top of your page, and it has to include your name as well as the topic. And then at the very bottom of your questionnaire, which should only be on one side of a page, you need to have a closing, just to thank you for taking the time to do this. It's a professional thing to do. Now, what is it going to look like? Well, I want you to use three different kinds of questions. And the three different kinds of questions may be familiar to you already. Number one is a fixed alternative. Um, I graduated from high school. Uh, I got my GED. Um, I don't, you know, whatever questions you might want to ask that have a yes, no, a fixed set of answers. You know, I was born in a hospital. I was born at home. I was born on the way to the hospital. I, you know, a fixed set of choices. Um, two, the Likert scale questions. I'm picky on these. I want you to use a five-point Likert scale. And the other picky part of it is, is that I want each one of those points on your Likert scale to have a verbal descriptor. All of the time, some of the time, occasionally, rarely, never. Whatever works for you and your the type of question that you're putting together. Um, that's what a Likert scale question is. And then no more, and I'm hoping just one, but no more than one or two um, open-ended questions that should be able to be answered in one to two sentences. And again, craft these carefully because you're trying to mine for gold. You're trying to figure out where this audience is at on your topic and what their preference or viewpoints are. So you have to use two Likert scale questions. You have to use two fixed alternative questions. You have to use one open-ended question, and then to get up to six questions, you can you know, use whatever combination that you want to, to get there of these types. You type your questions up. Here's my offer to you. If you're able to put together your questionnaire and email it to me as an attachment by Friday noon, I'll make the copies for you, and I'll have them here for you on Monday. Um, when you do that, I will send you back a confirmation email. If you don't get a confirmation email, you may have thought my, me my middle name was Allison. <coughs> so you might have typed my address wrong. So I want you to know that I got it. But if you, you don't get a reply from me, then you know that something's up. And then in which case you have to break. If you aren't able to pull that together by Friday, that's okay. Then you do it over the weekend, but then you bring the copies in. And we need, how many are we? 21? Right, let's, let's say 21 copies you need to bring to class on Monday. Send it to me by Friday, I'll make them. Otherwise, bring your own on Monday. Questions on putting that together. Think about those questions. Think about the most valuable pieces of information. Because remember that introduction where you're connecting with your audience? Some of that data should be able to be pulled in there. Now, you will eventually tabulate all your results, and you will print your results right on the form that you developed, and then that will get submitted for a grade as well, the tabulated results. Questions? No. Okay. Let me just real quick. Right? So, which over here? And I want to just tell you what else is in the folder here and go over the outline with you just briefly. So, okay, so here's that PowerPoint that I just did today. So if you want to look at that again, it's right there for your viewing. Here's the assignment descriptor. You've got a print copy of that. Here's the Monroe's Motivated Sequence copy that you've got that in green. Um, this is a really nice handout on the three pillars of persuasion, logos, pathos, and ethos. If you need some more in-depth explanation, this is a really great handout. Your audience analysis that I mentioned, is right here is where you're going to, um, that's the descriptor of, of what it was. Here's where you're going to submit your tabulated audience analysis results. Remember I mentioned to you that you're going to have a draft of your preparation outline that gets turned in here. Your final preparation outline gets turned in here. Um, this is what I'm going to evaluate you on, so you might want to pull that up and take a look at it. We'll talk a little bit about logical fallacies to avoid. Chapter 16 and 17 PowerPoints are here. You don't have to look at them, but they do have video examples embedded in them. And then here's your self-evaluation form. 
here's where I'll post your videos, and then here is something that a lot of people ask for, you know, and I, I just have never gotten it together until this time for you. So, what I have for you, here comes up, is that I asked permission of one of my students who gave what I thought was a pretty doggone good speech. Now I have to tell you, nobody's speech is perfect, so if you watch it and you think, whoa, what's with her? Well, nobody's speech is perfect, but he came pretty doggone close. The only thing he didn't do was adhere to the timeline, because I think he goes on for about 10 minutes. So that he got off for on the score. But here is a copy of his speech, a real live Massey College student, you know, maybe you do or maybe you don't. And then here's a copy of his, what I think is a very excellently prepared outline. So if you are the type of person who, oh man, I can just see what this looks like, it'll make life easier, there it is for you. Now, I have three minutes left. And I am going to use them all because now I want to take you over to the preparation outline. Now, this might seem a little silly, but I don't want anyone in here not to be successful. So, here's what it looks like. Let me open it up. I'm going to ask each of you to open this up and type right on it. And this is the part that's going to seem a little silly. I don't want you to take away any of my words. Leave my words on there. Because those are kind of like my guides to look at your outline as we go along. So you are going to fill this in. To persuade my audience to whatever it is you want to persuade us to. You are going to write a central thesis or idea for your speech, and you're going to type it in right here. You are going to write out word for word what you're doing for an open with impact. Whether you're using a quotation, some statistics, you're going to write down exactly what it is you're going to say. And then up here, you're going to tell me which device you used. I used a quotation. I used statistics. I used a story. Then, when you connect with your audience, what are you going to say? Type it out, word for word for word. When you establish your ethos, type it out, word for word for word, what you're going to say there. Now, when we get down to this next part, you don't have to give me paragraphs. You can do this in just phrases and words so that I can follow along. So each step that we talked about in the Rose Motivated Sequence is laid out for you here. You might not have to use one and two, if that's the case, you know. Just get rid of two. And then just simply type in what it is, what is the problem as you see it. Um, we go down here. Here's where you type in your transition. Here's each step in the solution. Here's your visualization. And your summarize, restate, and call to action for your conclusion. You need to have a work cited page in an online format and a list of whatever visual aids you're using. So you're going to type right on that form and remember that if at each of the A and B levels, you're going to tell me whether you're using logos or, or pathos or ethos there. And you may not need it in every single step, but you should have a pretty good healthy use of those three pillars throughout your speech. Questions? And you know what? You're probably feeling like, right now, a little overwhelmed, and if you don't, good for you. Um, but what I would suggest is, is that the question that you have is probably going to get you at about 2 o'clock this morning. And in which case, please send me an email. I won't answer it at 2 o'clock in the morning. But I will answer it right away in the morning. Don't, am, don't let any single question hold you up from being successful, because that's what I want to do. Hey! Before you persuade. And we'll see.